That is, there's just no way you can get an emotional brain going if you don't have a sensory motor system that's functional. And so if the child's sensory motor system itself is deprived in the first year, they're going to kind of stay there. And they're only going to develop part of this emotional brain and they'll only develop that part of the emotional brain that they need for what? For their defense system. You see? And then we find that when the high brain should start, it's really great activities. I mean, it's ethereal, it's divine activities around age four in the right hemisphere. And it's great creativity and imagination and intuition and all of those things and music, all that that opens up around age three to four just whole new universes of, of capacity open up, you see. But they must be built on functional systems in sensory motor and emotional. If the sensory motor and emotional had been deprived from the very beginning, the child is still back here trying to get their defense system together. And so what little bit of this uh, great creative brain up here they're going to develop will be developed in relation to what? enhancing their defense system so that you'll get a, a smarter and smarter reptile and that's a dangerous thing to have around. <laughs> but this is true. And so these are, the, these are, are, are some of the, the, the issues facing us. We're talking about brains developing or not developing. Alan Shore is the first one to put together all the research that showed it's not just that the brain doesn't develop the way we want it to, it doesn't even grow the neural cells it should. The even cellular growth is deprived, impaired, uh, compromised if the child isn't emotionally stimulated. Now we think that, that the growth of a, of, a, of a great brain should be what? Intellectual stimulus. And the quicker the better. Not at all. You have to observe and honor these developmental stages. And if you try to get high intellectual growth, which is connected with these later years, in real early, what happens? You have deprived the establishment of the foundations on which the high intellectual brain has to rest. So then you're demanding of the child activity when they don't even have the foundation to support it. I've, I've often likened this developmental scheme of nature's, and she spent a long time on it, uh, to a blueprint for a house. We can easily enough look at these very early sensory motor years as putting in the foundation, and then the walls, and then we're going to put a roof on as we go along. And finally, when we get the whole structure all put together, they're ready for some really fancy footwork in the intellectual world, about age 11 or 12. And that's when we can start and put furniture in there. Now, let me just say that the, the great thing about Waldorf is that it follows the developmental scheme. I, uh, Steiner really understood the developmental plan of nature. He understood it perfectly. Uh, and since then, in, in the 80 years since then, he's been verified on every hand. Some of his statements that I used to, when I first started running across it 20 years ago, I thought the guy was nuts. <laughs> and then here comes the research that verifies it. So of all the educational systems I know of, Maria Montessori had a lot of great things to say for the very early child. There's no question of that. And great things to say for later on. But to my way of thinking and my prejudice, I think that certainly Steiner education most perfectly matches the developmental stages, and what can be expected of each child. The great thing about Steiner, of course, Waldorf schools, is the nurturing. And the next greatest thing is the model of the teacher. And the idea that a curricula can ever, ever take the place of the living exemplar of the teacher is one of the most profound errors that any society could ever make. And of course, we look at our prison population, which has doubled within the past five years or so. It's doubling faster and faster and faster. We're over two million now. And it's the greatest single outlay of money in the United States, except for defense, even greater than all education put together, and not one penny will we offer in any way to help a newborn infant and her mother 
to stay alive. That is the greatest single tragedy. I remember when I remember when they had that White House conference about four years ago. They had some of the best people in child development in the world at the White House, and they spelled out exactly what the situation was. Three months later, all welfare help for new mothers was withdrawn entirely, and the statement was, let them get a job, put the kid in daycare. And was that popular with the whole government? Of course it was. Now, this again, we're dealing with highly irrational, I would call it totally insane actions <laughs> on the part of a culture. No, I'm very serious about that because it's leading directly to the culture's destruction. In Sweden, what, 40 years ago, they instituted a program for giving every mother at the birth of her child a full year's leave of absence if she were working with full pay or paying her to stay home even if she didn't have jobs with the child for that first year. That saved the state of Sweden such huge amounts of money that they then extended it to both mothers or fathers for that privilege and have now extended it to three years for the mothers on a gradual tapering scale. It's been picked up by, by Holland, by Austria, and a few other enlightened nations. <laughs> and their criminal prison population has dwindled to almost zero. Okay? Now, you would have to carry through. If you do that only in the first three years and then you beat them up for the rest of their childhood, <laughs> you're not going to get very far along with it. it the, the Waldorf School set up in Marysville, California, behind bars for teenagers, is one of the most hopeful single signs I've ever come across. It's a Waldorf-based school in prison for teenagers, and the effects of it have been simply astonishing. How do they approach these, these prisoners? And some of them are pretty tough customers. Storytelling, drawing, play acting, mostly play, uh, and what? Music. music, above all, certainly lots and lots of music. Uh, Ann Marsden, working for many, many years on her own, out of her own pocket in upstate New York with hardcore federal penitentiary teenagers who had only one thing to look forward to, and that was their graduation to Sing Sing at 21. And it really was, because they were in for life. And she started working with them, and she finally found how to approach them. She found they had no image of self. You couldn't say they had a low self-esteem. They had no image of self at all because they had no internal imagery at all, no capacity to create internal images. And you find that the case with the vast majority of the children now. They have no capacity for creating internal images. And what she did was she used essentially Waldorf techniques and was having incredible results. I mean, these were extremely rough people to try to deal with. It took her many months to break in for the first time. She finally ended up by saying, if the, if the nation as a whole understood how easily salvageable they were, we could only sit and weep. How easily salvageable. How hungry they were for, for, for really salvation. But how did she approach them? What did she do? She read to them the simplest little stories over and over and over and over and finally caught, up, caught their imagination and talked them into starting and acting these stories out in play acting. They were nearly all totally illiterate and considered hopelessly illiterate and unteachable. After months and months of this play acting and, and storytelling and them all sitting there memorized, uh, mesmerized, they, they did just like the little child. Their chins would drop down, they're staring, and she would tell them these stories and they started to act them out and doing all these things that she had them doing. Then bringing them big uh, sheets of, of, of white paper with block crayons and all to, to draw on. And she said the first time it began to happen that the hair ra rose on the back of her head practically. It was an eerie experience. They started spontaneously reading and writing. And she didn't know where it came from. In the state of Virginia, I, I've been into many a penitentiary trying to teach meditation. And a friend of mine were in the, uh, uh, over, went over to the women's penitentiary about two, two years ago 
trying to get in. We were going to set up a book program for them and so on and so forth. We weren't allowed in anymore. Tough love is the new statement. And uh, so they're throwing out all attempts even for uh, rehabilitation and saying we're just, we have to get tough with these guys and let them know we mean it. Now, I, I'm only saying that a huge amount of our national income goes that way and a terrible cost of human souls. Now I want to get into one other bit of information, and that's neurocardiology. Here again, we have Rudolf Steiner. Almost 100 years ago, Steiner said that the great discovery of late 20th century science would be that the heart is not a pump, but vastly, profoundly more than that. And then he made this strange statement that the greatest challenge we would face in the new millennium or late 20th century would be to allow the heart to teach us to think in a new way. The new discovery is that between the heart and the limbic structure or the emotional cognitive structure of the brain, there are unmediated neural connections. This was the discovery of the laces over 30 years ago. They did a 30-year research on this under grants from the National Institutes of Health, John and Beatrice Lacey. And they discovered unmediated neural connections between the brain and the heart and published in what many neuroscientists have said the most beautiful neuroscience work that's ever been done. They published their results and were absolutely stonily ignored by the entire scientific community because they said that all the signals show a tremendous interaction or dialogue between the heart and the emotional brain in our head. That instant by instant, the emotional brain was sending the heart its impression of how we're getting along in the world, how we're relating to it, and receiving instructions, or as they said, at least exhortations from the heart of an appropriate response to make. Since that time, neurocardiology has come out as one of our most exciting new fields of medicine. And this is on the discovery that anywhere from 60 to 65 percent, depending on whose research you're, you're reading, of all cells of the heart are neurons exactly like in your head, functioning in what we call ganglia of, of neural cells in their groupings, that these neural cells of the heart communicate with each other through the same neurotransmitters that they do in the brain, through the same dendrites and axons in the brain and these ganglia in the heart. They produce the same hormones and all of that that they do in the brain, and the heart functions very literally as the fifth brain in our body. So we've got the reptilian brain, the old mammalian brain, the, the, the forebrain, and the prefrontal lobes as our first four brains up here. And the real granddaddy or grandmother of them all here in our heart. And this discovery has led us into a lot of very interesting things. They've also discovered not only is the heart a major area of intelligence, not verbal intellect as up here in the head, but intelligence but it produces hormones that maintain control over the whole brain and the whole body. Through this dialogue with the emotional brain, it directs as best it can the actions of the whole brain system. Half of the, hor of the neurons of the heart are connected to the major organs throughout our body. And through that, the heart is the one that maintains what we call homeostasis, the way the whole system with all of its many different parts manages to be one single coherent functioning unit. That's the job of the heart. Uh, the other thing about the heart is, and that which makes it the most exciting to me, is it's a very powerful electromagnetic generator. The heart produces an electromagnetic field which resonates out some 12 to 15 feet beyond the body 
And in this electromagnetic field going beyond the body, apparently we find contained all the information that the brain uses to build up its knowledge of a world itself. We know that essentially this same electromagnetic torus surrounds the Earth. That's been known for a long time. We know that one surrounds the sun and encompasses the entire solar system. So the one in our heart is, in effect, a nested hierarchy, in, in a nested hierarchy of electromagnetic fields. The heart is literally the heart of the universe. I mean, the heart, our heart, is connected with <laughs> whatever there is everywhere. I remember my meditation teacher in, in India saying, there's only one heart. The one in your chest is the same as in mine. The only one heart. That's why even transplant hearts you can't do that with brains. It doesn't transplant very well. They, 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 they discover that the Institute of Heart Math down in California is really quite interesting. It's a little independent bunch, but not much money. They've been working for 35 years now on brain research and heart research. And they have found direct evidence of certain crystalline structures in the heart and that it's that connection that this universal thing is trying to bring out. Why did nature create a totally different brain about 40,000 years ago? And why is we had this tremendous problem in the human species is simply we're trying to learn to use it. And what's the great, the great enemy to using it? Paul McLean, in his 40 years of research at NIH, said the great enemy to developing the high intellectual brain is our defensive reptilian brain. We go on the defensive all the time. We threaten each other all the time. We threaten our children all the time. They feel under the gun all the time. And what happens? We shift from here to here. What's the answer? You see, how do we get out of this and into this? Paul McLean, finally, he's way up in his 80s now. I guess he's 90. He was turning out brilliant papers up until three years ago. I got the last paper from him in 1997. I, I think he's still alive. But he finally had given up, and he said, our violence was outstripping our capacity to deal with it, and he didn't believe we would survive. But Paul McLean had not really gotten himself informed about neurocardiology and the discovery that the heart is not a pump, but profoundly more than that, and that the greatest challenge we face is to allow the heart, which is really the heart of this universe, this is no joke. Steiner knew exactly what he was talking about. So I'm going to say this, that what Steiner education is all about is to lead that child to the true maturation of the human being, which is to open up the intellect of this incredible creative brain to the intelligence of the heart and allow the heart to teach you to think in a new way. Stein, everyone else, said, here we have verse 1, 4, 7, 7, 15, and all the developmentalists, except Rudolf Steiner, had said, well, at 15, the brain myelinates, and we know it does. That is, it stabilizes. And as they say, what you have is what you've got for the rest of your life. But you can build on it, but you can't build any more brain. We find that's not true at all. Steiner says, not at all. He says, around 18, there's a huge sh shift and at 21, he said, it's not until 21 that the true mature ego should come down into the body. Uh, what did he mean by all that? Well, that didn't make any sense until the recent research. And what does it show? That the prefrontal lobes, nature's latest and newest brain structure, added just the other day in evolutionary history to systems that are hundreds of millions of years old, and these are very powerful and well entrenched, and this new one is not at all. There's a marvelous guy by the name of Gil Bailey who wrote an incredible book called Violence Unveiled. And Gil Bailey said, Love is the most fragile of all intelligences and the most difficult to establish. And here evolution has been trying to establish it over and over and over, but what is it that defeats it? this retreat to the reptilian, to the defensive. And so how can we nurture and protect and develop this, to develop that highest possible 
intelligence. Well, the other thing is they found is that around 15, when all the rest of the brain has developed and, and stabilized and myelinated, that there's a huge brain growth spurt where? Right here in this orbital frontal, prefrontal lobe right behind your skull. The latest, newest evolutionary structure didn't even develop back in here except partly to try to govern the system enough so that it wouldn't go, ha go completely haywire. Getting ready for what? When all the rest of it was stabilized and ready to, to function fully, this one goes into its greatest growth spurt and is still, and this is direct quote from the research, still laying down its neural tracks, still putting in its neural basis all the way up until age 21 and not complete until then. So what should we find? We find huge changes in behavior uh, at age one, at age four, at age seven, at age 11. Each one is a totally different child. Surely you've recognized that if you've ever had any children. These profound changes at these periods. And at 15, well here at 21 should be the most profound change of all. Uh, two physicists, uh, Langer and Alexander, turned out a book called Higher Stages of Conscience, published by Oxford back in 1988, and they pointed out that if the, if the exponential increase at each of these periods, the fact that intelligence just goes through these light year leaps, there's no bridge between them, it's so huge at each of these times, but the one that should occur in this late development stage here is vastly be beyond all of that added and put together, and nothing happens at all. There are three things about the adolescent I want to leave you with tonight. And that is a feeling, it crops up somewhere around age 11, this first one, of acute, almost painful idealism. You say, idealist? They are so painfully idealistic the first thing they do is look in their environment for a model around which they can orient this tremendous feeling of idealism. What are they given? Rap music, MTV, your sports stars, your, your uh, political stars, and all the rest of them. Now think of their models. Who are their models? By the time they're 14, they are as bitter and cynical. Why? because this huge thing is opened up that wants to embrace and it meets the most caustic environment in the world and they retreat. The next thing that opens up is a feeling of secret, hidden greatness. Surely you can remember that from your own adolescence. And I'm serious about this because I remember it. When I was 16, I felt if they, and they is the world out there, just knew who I really was, they would take off their coats and put them down for me in the street. <laughs> but I didn't know who I was. All I knew is who I was was incredibly great. And I looked for what? A model by which I could release that and become it according to the nature of my model. We call that nature's model imperative. No intelligence can unfold except through a model, and the intelligence unfolds according to the character, nature, and quality of the model. You will not find an exception to that in all of human experience. The same thing at this age. And the third and final thing is the feeling of great expectation. Something tremendous is supposed to happen. And it's supposed to happen right now. And from about 15 or 16, we look for it around every corner. It's right over the next hill. But what happens? Like the boy riding home from his, his junior year of college when he said he had wakened in the night with the cold hand of terror gripping his heart. And the issue was, ever since he was 14, he's been waiting for something tremendous to happen. He used just that phrase. And he realized in the middle of the night with that cold hand of terror gripping him that he was almost 21. For seven years he had been waiting for it to happen. It had not happened. And what hit him in the middle of the night was it was never going to happen. And his, his statement to his parents was, I, I can live with the fact that it will never happen, but I feel I can't live with the fact of never knowing what it was supposed to have been. 
We've all gone through something like that. Now that, these three things, why do they crop up here around the 15th year with a tremendous force? Why? And I've had hundreds of young adolescents talk to me about this, and they'll always gesture to their heart when they say that. Why? Because it's the heart that's aching for that. It's looking for its next level of intelligence to open up and be developed. Its next universe to open up and explore, just as it had in each of these periods. When is that? Around 15. Why? Because we're having a brain, brain growth spurt in the latest evolutionary addition to the brain. What has evolution been? Evolution has been one thing, a transcendent process. Nature had to rise and go beyond the limitations of reptilian brain. It took her hundreds of millions of years to, to build it. It's going to take her many, many millions of years to build a mammalian brain in order to do what? Overcome the, the handicaps, the limitations, the constraints on this ancient system. How does she do it? Not by reinventing the sensory motor wheel. She uses what she's already developed and builds a greater system on it. And each one should then incorporate the lower into the higher as you go along. Nature never intended for the higher to be incorporated into the lower as is happening now. And it's happened. I'm not saying we've ever had a golden age in which this is, has worked right. But we have enough information now for the possibility of that golden age to open up. So what does Steiner education do? What was, what was behind Rudolph when he said, don't teach him to read and write too soon? He said, let reading, let reading alone for a while. Plenty of time for that later. It, when when in, in Switzerland they, they stopped uh, their ed starting in Europe in general, uh, putting kids in school at age eight and said, we're going to start and put them in at seven, Steiner raised Cain. He said, you better not do this. You're going to be trying to bring about these later developmental things too soon and then they won't develop fully the foundations they need to do this later development. And of course we didn't pay the least bit of attention to him. And what would he think when we're trying to teach him to read and write practically in utero? See, it, it, it just makes no sense whatsoever. So Steiner Education says no, he rigged up a curricula and a way of training teachers that they could be the living models for what the brain needs at each of these critical stages. That's why they have one teacher stays with the child throughout a whole developmental section. Why? Because you've got all this time for them to develop. They can take their own time. They can develop at their own pace. And here are 200 million parents, frenetic, that their kids be computers the minute they come out of the womb, preferably, and teach them to read and write before anybody else or they might lose out on becoming the third Bill Gates or whatever it might be. Now, what are the results? The 85% of all academic honors in the United States are taken by foreign-born students. A handful of your students are taking 85% of all the honors. And what are we doing with the rest of them? We're condemning their, their school teachers, putting dunce caps on their heads, and they're not responsible for the damage. They're damaged before they get there. Where does the damage come from? Hospital technological childbirth is the biggest number one. It's the greatest travesty that's ever happened in the world. The research on that keeps piling up sky high, but its biggest, it brings in two-thirds of all medical revenue. And if you think you can even touch it with a 10-foot pole, you're crazy. The next thing is daycare. The next thing is television. And content on television has nothing to do with the damage. It's the device itself. It's the electromagnetic types of electromagnetic fields that are coming from it. The fact that 1,500 American children are hospitalized yearly for going into severe epileptic seizures in front of the television. And we know that the majority of little children looking at television look at it in absolute privacy without an adult supervising. We have no idea how many tens of thousands of children go into epileptic seizure in front of that television. Electromagnetic fields can tear the system all to pieces. Why? It's made of them. 
The brain is one great big electromagnetic field translating other electromagnetic fields. And we think we can devise all sorts of artificial electronic fields and bombard our child with them from the beginning on when they're critically needing what? Appropriate information according to the type of brain structure that's opening at that time. It isn't working. It isn't going to work. And they're in serious trouble. One final thing about that. Now, that's what Waldorf education is all about. An, an education that is appropriate to the needs of the child. And if you can't wait, then go ahead and rush your child. But when they become one of the massive number of children committing suicide, just remember that you've been warned. Suicide, according to an NPR program just the other day, is now the third highest cause of death in all American children between ages 5 and 17. The third highest cause of death. More boys by far commit suicide than girls, and far more girls attempt suicide than boys. Boys are, by their tendency toward violence, always are much more successful with it than girls. Suicide is all the way down to age three. This was published in 1988 by the National Institute of Health. <laughs> Studies done then, all the way down to age three. Fifty years ago, there were no recorded incidences of suicide in history that we knew of under age 14. This has all happened within a 50-year period. Combination, medical, technological, hospital, childbirth, separate infants from their others, elimination of 97% of all breastfeeding over almost a 40-year period, it's up to about 3 or 4% now, uh, daycare, and inappropriate use of electronic devices with children. And the pressure right now to computerize the entire public educational system is huge. They've already hundreds of billions of dollars in it. And if you think you're going to stand in front of that, believe me, you can't. We found that out in California. So here at the very time when, when this huge gift of knowledge about the child and what, what can really give us truly a golden age and the human spirit coming into its own, it's just being given us by great research people like Rudolf Steiner. Don't forget Steiner had a PhD in the sciences from a German university. He was no fool. He wasn't a strange mystic or anything else. He was a, a great spiritual giant with a PhD, and I say that's a very safe thing to have around. <laughs> uh, so I, I, would, I would urge you to support your Waldorf education, support these charter schools that are coming up, that are Waldorf-based. It's, it's, it's a hybrid, but it's a way on the site better than nothing. Now, I know I've probably insulted a lot of you, and I've, I've probably made a lot of you unhappy, but I, I had five of them under the old system, and I brought them up, and I know, I know what the old system was like. And I've had one born at home <laughs> uh, where everything worked differently. And, and believe me, it, it's worth the effort. It's worth the effort. Now, what do you do if they've already been damaged? Well, what do you do with you? We're all damaged. I mean... <laughs> What can we do? You, you can do like Rudolf Steiner said. He said, allow the heart to teach you to think in a new way. According to Marion Diamond, the brain is absolutely plastic and flexible and changeable right up to the last minute of a very long life. And so support your Waldorf system. Get involved in it. Te uh, parents have to take a part in that whole effort of Waldorf. And you'll find that a tremendous change happens in you as well. I'm going to shut up. I'll open it up to about two minutes of questions. I'm, I have no idea. Two minutes of questions. Yes, ma'am. I would just like to have your feelings on if you feel we have enough time. Well, I certainly think that we have enough time. I would mention also that particularly in Steiner families, there are children being born with very huge prefrontal lobes. This is the latest evolutionary addition to the brain. And these children that are coming into the world any time that you have a true spiritual grounding and do distinguish between spiritual and religious or, or state religion and that kind of thing. Jane Goodall has given us 
probably as good information on this nurturing thing as anybody has. Her, her examples of chimpanzees that don't get nurtured and what horrible creatures they turn into and tend to produce children in exactly the same, the same fashion. It's, it's, it's a really very frightful thing. Yes? What I'm curious about with this new aspect of the frontal lobe, is there a downside to that? And is there some aspect where the heart has to still guide the development of the neo cor of the, uh, the frontal lobes, that is? The, the, there's no downside of the prefrontals because they simply won't grow unless they're nurtured. Uh, you'll get a pruning back of that and a lack of ability to monitor one's own behavior. That's, that's the downside of it. The other thing is the prefrontals and the heart then go into, into frequency sync if they are developed. Mm. It's the heart that will develop the prefrontal lobes. There's no question of that. And there's no question that we would then learn to think in a new way. As for, as for the, the beauty of, of Waldorf, of course it involves a great deal of sensory motor, but not on this level. It's using the sensory motor on behalf of the highest intelligences up here. Mm -hmm. And then it's developing the emotional in response to the needs of these higher structures up here. If, they, if we have one therapeutic system really going for us in this country, it seems to me Waldorf education. But unfortunately, Waldorf is having to spend more and more of its time in therapy and less and less of its time in actual development. And that's a real, real tragedy. And I've, what, having watched it over a 20-year period, I've heard this from more and more teachers all the time. Less and less are they able to just do Waldorf. And more and more they're having to work to patch up these children and keep them going. And now you have the problem of the children's parents then bucking them, uh, bucking the Waldorf people. But where are the computers? Where is reading and writing faster than anybody else? And so on and so forth while they're trying to develop all these other incredible intelligences. If you ever really look, yes, one other thing. Yeah, I just want to understand yeah. this then, that, so that from what you're saying, um, that everything can, can develop as rich as possible, but unless one really keeps the heart open in those teenage years, you're not going to get this full functioning of the frontal lobe then. And well, now that would make it sound like the door closes. And believe me, it doesn't close. Uh, there, there's an old statement by a wise guy that said the laborer coming to that vineyard at the 11th hour gets the same wage as the one that comes at the first hour. And Marion Diamond couches it in these terms that the brain is highly flexible right up to the last minute and can change and adapt. And so I think that's, that's your answer to that. No, certainly most of, our, most of our children are not even getting up to this age. Uh, at the University of, of Oklahoma in 1985, I was there for a whole week, and they had just run a, a series of tests on their incoming freshmen to see where they were on the Piaget and scale. They found only 50% of them had arrived at an 11-year-old age on development. Most of them were locked very much back into the sensory motor and concrete operational. So they then rigged up another set of tests for them in their junior year to see what three years of university training had done for them. No change at all. They were still here. <laughs> That's because the university training was not designed to go back and pick up all of this. Now, if they had, if they had done like Ann Marsden's group of people in the, in the prisons and put those boys back into, into doing these, above all, play. Play is the most critical of all, all intelligence. I'd written that, I, I, I wrote that back in, uh, in 1975 in Magical Child. That, I talked talk about the intelligence of play as the most critical of all things. Play is literally the most critical of all things, and what they object to most in Waldorf schools is that children seem to play so much. <laughs> and surely they better, and you better get all your children to playing again as quick as you can. The disappearance of play in America is a, one of the biggest single issues I come across all the time. It's probably very late. Thank you.